Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Meet La Prensa. Viewer, if you like what you see here, if you're finding value, it would be a big help if you like and subscribe to our channel. We really appreciate you. So we have another very special guest here today, another great fighter, another Latina fighter in the newsroom who got screwed over by her newsroom, who is here to talk about it today. This is actually the fourth Latina that we discussed on this show. The first being Mariana Atencio at MSNBC, who was told by some unnamed source at 30 Rock not to look too Latina when she came down here a couple years ago for the White House Correspondence Dinner. The second was Estefany Mendez at Univision San Francisco, who was told who Univision colluded with the employee union to leverage her DACA status to have her dismissed, according to Stephanie's story. So Lori Lizarraga from News 9 Denver was just on last week talking about her story. Her colleague, Sonia Gutierrez, also from formerly of News 9, is now here today to tell us our story. And we are honored to pieces to have you here today, Sonia. Sonia Gutierrez, thank you so much for joining us on Meet La Prensa. Uh, thank you so much, Pablo, for even being interested in our story and for elevating all of our voices. This is so important. Honestly, I'm not the only one who's interested in your story. The entire industry is interested in your story. From the moment Lori's uh, essay went live in Westward, Every journalism chat in America has been blowing up sharing the story and the tweets and the subsequent outcome that's come of it. So I guess let's start with like just a baseline question. What happened at Nine News in Denver, Colorado? You know, to put, to put it simply, um, I was there for three years. I signed a three-year contract and my contract was not renewed. Um, this came after no uh, being on no performance plan, getting no sort of warning, I was completely shocked uh, because at the time I really considered myself one of the star reporters of that station. Um, it was a very challenging time and we had to jump through a lot of different hoops to do the stories that we believed in. But um, I, we have that fight. We have that heart. We have that passion for what we do. And we were willing to do that to tell the stories that needed to be told. So um, we endured that for the three years. And then ultimately, it was a very short call, just like Lori's, where I was told um, we have the end of your contract is coming up. We have a decision to make to renew or not renew. And we've decided not to renew. Do you have any questions? <laughs> just like that. And I was so so shocked that I, I, I was like, well, you know, for next steps, what this, this and that, que ni les pregunté. I didn't even ask them why, you know, I was, yeah, I come from an immigrant family. So being at that station in the communities in the state that I grew up in, where my parents can watch, um, it was a huge sense of pride for my family que su, La, su hija inmigrante made it to that station. So cuando me dieron esa noticia, me dio, it was so shocking and shameful. I, for a long time, I didn't even tell my parents. And that is a huge deal because we're super tight knit as a family. Y I didn't tell my parents because no sabía ni qué decirles, you know, forever. Yo les decía, mami, papi, you know, like, en el trabajo nos tratan así. At work, they treat us this way. It's very difficult for many different reasons. And coming from the family that I do, that are immigrant parents, they were always just like, mija, dale gracias a Dios that you have this job. You know, like, turn your other cheek for them to hit you there. Like, but just stay silent and, and like, just do your job. Usted, usted, haga lo que you're there for, you know? But it's, it was this fight inside of me because I knew that I was, this is a family that I come from, but at the same time, you know, I knew that I was a great journalist, that I had a lot to give, that I had been giving a lot of myself. And for all of it to come to this was very disappointing. So Latinos in the newsroom are so, uh, Latin, Latinx news workers are so often required to turn the other cheek. And again and again, we do. And yet the results we get, you know, 
quantitative evidence shows that Latinos as a whole have not advanced in the news business in the 50 years that that has been collected on this. So when you, and I've been here too, I've been there too. When you run out of cheeks to turn, right? We reach a boiling point. And I feel like that's kind of where we are at right now. So tell us, like you mentioned some of the hoops that you had to jump through in order to do your job, to report the news. What are some of the hoops that you had to jump through? You know, one of the largest uh, examples for me was uh, when I had this rule placed on me that because of my immigrant status, um, I, from every immigration story that I did from that moment forward, I had to either disclose my own immigration status on television or pass on the story. And uh, when that meeting happened, it was, I can tell that my managers were not ready for me to push back because I, I told them, you know, well, why, why is this happening? Why am I getting this rule placed upon me when I see my colleagues um, don't have to jump through these hoops? And I was told that, oh, it's actually for the protection of your family. And I was shocked because I, I told them, I'm, I never asked you for any sort of protection of my family. You know, like that's not a good excuse. I didn't ask for this. So why are you doing this? And, um, and I told them, has there ever been any bias in any of my reporting, immigration or otherwise? Because I know that as a Latina journalist, my stories are seen with a different lens. And because of that, I make sure every duck is in a row before I publish anything. And that means extra work. And I'm willing to do that. And I do it for every single story. So I ask you again, have you noticed any bias in my reporting? And is that why this is happening? And, and what did they first, say? And at first they were like, no, not at all. We're so happy with your work. This is just because we are trying to make sure that no one comes at us or you or your family about your journalism and that, you know, there, there could be any sort of bias. And I told them, I was like, well, if, if I'm, you're telling me it's for the protection of my family and I'm telling you, I don't need protection of my family. <laughs> and then, and, and I'm asking you if you've seen any bias in my reporting and it doesn't seem like you have any examples, I'm not sure what we're doing here, you know? And then one of the managers was like, well, there was this one story. And I was like, which one, which one? Give me an example. And she's like, the one we did this weekend about, you know, um, the immigration story you did this week. And I was like, you mean the one that you, the script you approved? Is that the one we're talking about? And immediately she took it back and said, no, no, not that one. No, I, I looked at the script. Of course, it was fine. No, uh, I think there were some other ones. And I was like, please, I need to know exactly what stories you're talking about, what parts, and we need to sit down and go through them. If, if this is, this is true. And uh, she said, I, I'll, I'll put it together um, and, and let you know after the meeting. And I said, OK, well, this is a very, very serious matter. And I'm going to write a follow up email about the meeting, what was said here and the fact that you that we're going to follow up with this. And I expect something soon. And I sent the email. I put it in writing because obviously I'm a journalist. I know what I need to do to protect myself. And I sent the email and I never got anything back. Nothing. No examples of nothing. N not even an email. Nothing. Two days later, um, the higher up called me and said, hey, Sonia, I noticed that you were a little on edge during the meeting. Can we talk about it? And I said, absolutely, I was because I was being placed in a box um, that no other journalist in this newsroom is being placed in. I was being asked to do something simply because I am an immigrant woman working in this newsroom with no proof, with no proof of why I need to be doing this. So this to me is a blatant example of discrimination because of who I am.
So the FTC seems to agree with you uh, that this was, at least on the surface, it looks like a discrimination case. In fact, they've even launched, as I understand it, an investigation following Lori's essay. So I guess a question that I, I got to ask is, in terms of the deliverable of calling out your immigration status on air, let's say hypothetically, you are not as strong as you are. Let's say hypothetically, you acquiesced to these requests. What does that even sound like? So I'm Sonia, Gut I'm Sonia Gutierrez, immigrant at Nine News, reporting on immigration. Like, how does that work? Like, what? You what, what that I don't understand what they were asking you to do. This is I've never, and I've been following Latino cases of Latinos just getting destroyed in the news business over and over again and over again, which is why it's so heartening to see you three, Lori, you, Kristen, standing up and standing up for yourselves, despite all of the wrong advice that's come your way about not standing up for yourselves. But what does that sound like? How, how, what did they want you to do? I think that because of the nature of our lives, that we know that how dangerous that could be, that sounds like a journalist who will never do immigration stories for that station again. Because right. any immigrant who is asked to go on television and say that they and their families are here undocumented, they're, we're, they're just not going to take that risk. And then who loses? The community who doesn't get those stories told. Because that journalist is not going to do that. If, if, if I wouldn't have fought back, I would have stopped telling those stories. That's what I would have done. So Lori Lizarraga mentioned that this type of environment, this editorial environment, was incredibly discouraging in that it made it so that the stories you knew were important that you were there to cover about our communities, about immigrant communities, were not worth covering because you weren't able to do it on the ethical journalistic terms that you had set forth as yourselves, for yourselves as journalists, right? So when the meeting happened and then afterwards they didn't follow up, what ended up being the resolution? Did you send, did you then pitch more immigration stories or not? And if you did, what were the what hoops that you had to jump through then? Yeah, exactly. So um, the resolution of that um, was that I was not going to be required to go on television and say my immigration status because I further explained the risks that that meant for my family and how wrong this was. But um, what ended up happening was that he asked me to pitch whenever I had an immigration pitch to pitch it to the managers first before the um, meeting, before the editorial meeting. And I was told that it was because every time I pitched immigration stories, the room was silent and was awkward. And I was like, oh, it is. I, I didn't know that, you know. And I and I I pushed back a little bit on that as well. But I was like, you know what, if you are my boss and I respect you as my manager and if this is what I need to do to tell the stories that need to be told in this community, then I will come an hour earlier and I will pitch these stories and I will vet them with you and I will do what I need to do to tell the stories and still be able to do them. And sometimes, and that's what I did for some stories. And for other stories, I was just told, like, we have other breaking news. We need to send you over here. Uh, but we, like, you have this other pitch. Can you give your sources to someone else? And I, more often than not, had to give Whoa. my sources uh, and the people that I wanted to interview away to other reporters to do our stories. Because um, I, I was chasing something else. So you're a Latina from an immigrant community, an immigrant family covering an immigrant story, and you were required to give, correct me if I'm wrong, your immigrant sources to other reporters. This obviously begs the question, were these reporters that you were supposed to not only provide your contacts to, but I assume brief in some way, shape or form as to what the story is. So you know, in essence, you're writing the story for them or producing this, you're co-producing the story for them. Absolutely. Uh, and was, are these reporters really Latinas? Impressive. Are these reporters his? No. And often the reporters didn't speak Spanish. 
So either were they white? Person, so, so some were, um, most of them actually. So um, Latina immigrant from an immigrant family covering immigrant stories in Denver, Colorado, is told that she either has to declare on air her immigration status, or she has to give her Latino sources about this Latino story, about this immigrant story to white journalists in some cases who don't speak Spanish. Wow. So you're right. You're doing your own stories. And at this point, you're pretty much co-producing their stories too. Oh, that happened so many times. I mean, there, that, that was normal for, it got so, no, it became very normal for us because we like at the station, we would bring a lot of exclusives, leading stories. Like whenever there were big stories here, uh, often we would make contact with the families and the families trusted us. And sometimes we were off, off of work and they would call us to get in touch with the families in the stories to confirm things. And then, then further pass along the context. So here's, here's an example of just how much this would happen. Um, before, after I was told that my contract was not going to get renewed, um, I had expressed interest in the investigative position in the investigative team at the station, but I was always told that I wasn't ready. Um, and before, uh, after I was told that my contract wasn't getting renewed, we hired a white man on that team. And I was sent an email asking if to set up a coffee date with him and give him all of my sources and the stories that I was following up on so that they could still be told. And that to me gave me the message that somehow I wasn't ready, but my work was. And the white reporter was who you're doing the job for him. Um, so, and did, did, would, would there be a co byline or would he share a byline with you? Would it say we're no. reporting by no? No, no, so let me get not. this straight. Nine News basically makes you work double time, right? Nine News makes you do your stories and this other guy's stories and other people's stories, right? Um, so that they can get all the credit for your work. But on top of that, I mean, one thing, at least here in Washington, right? The, the journalists protect their sources. Like they don't share their sources. They sit on their sources. And in many cases, they sit on their sources in a way that can become like, you know, very, very contentious when it comes to like, hold on a second. Who do you know at the White House? Who do you know in Congress? And in the, in the, in the immigrant community too, like there, I mean, there are only a couple reporters and I've been here 12 years. There are only a couple reporters I've ever met who actually know the bus boys in the restaurants here where reporters eat and drink. Uh, yeah. So the idea that these people would be like in, 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 in this context, anyway, in the political reporting world, the idea that you would hand off your sources is just not happening. It's absolute. That is something that is a hill to die on for most of the reporters I know. So how did you cope with this complete lack of professionalism and I mean, obviously, it's understandable just how upset you would be when they bring you into an ambush meeting and say, listen, your contract's not being renewed when you're already doing their work and their work, you know, over here and your work. So how do you cope with that? Like, how, how do you, Lori and Kristen, come together as Latinas to cope with this? Like, how do you support each other, if you will? And the reason I'm asking is because this is not uncommon. I'm no, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. So what would be the guidance that you would give somebody else going through this, like with, the, with their fellow Latinas in the newsroom? The way that I, I always kept in mind what was most the, my bottom line, which was these stories are important and they need to be told. And if I don't pitch them, no one else in this room will pitch them. And if I don't vouch for them, no one else in this room will vouch for them. If they need to be told and I'm not going to be allowed to tell them, then someone else will and I will do everything that I can for it to be told the right way. Um, that's how I coped with it. I just remembered that bottom line. Que what was important was these stories needed to be told. Y si yo no, and if I didn't pitch them, no one else was going to. And that's what I just remembered. Just the people that trusted me with their stories, um, that trusted me to want to say something and speak up. And I did everything that I could to at least 
prepare whatever reporter was going into stories with the background that they needed, with this is how these are the the kinds of words to use. This is how you approach an interview like this. And I would also talk to my sources and make it very clear. I fought for this story. I wanted to do this story. I was not allowed to, but I've done what I could with the reporter, you know? And I, every time this, after the stories aired mine and then the ones I helped in, I would call those sources and say, hey, how are you doing? What'd you think? What are some good follow-ups? Things like that. So I just would keep those relationships. I was very transparent with those relationships. And in the newsroom, I would do everything that I can um, to make sure that our communities were being represented fairly. Like I would, I would go, I had an anchor who would send me scripts that would talk about like DACA or anything like that and just tell me, hey, just give this a look. And I would, or even if anchors wouldn't ask me, I would go down the rundown because I knew what stories we were going to cover, read the scripts. And if anything was wrong, I would go to the anchor and say, hey, this is how I would write it. And this is why. So it just meant a lot of extra work. The Federal Trade Commission is now investigating nine news for discrimination. Have you been contacted by them? Yes. So well, by the I, investigator on behalf of the of the company. And how's that going? Can you up, can you update us to that or is it if not that that's fine. Obviously, I'm not I'm not yeah. I didn't ask Lori to name names. I'm not asking you to name names. I'm looking forward to the report from the FTC. But if you <laughs> want to name names by all means, Name names. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to it as well. Um, we're still trying to figure out, you know, the best way forward and what, like, it's hard to trust. You, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing the legwork on who to trust and who not to. So that's kind of where we're at right now. But I am looking forward to see what happens. We've already seen um, an incredible outpour of support. I mean, to have state, city, and school board leaders m schedule meetings with the g former general manager on your behalf is incredible. I mean, if that isn't empowering and validating, the validation that we never got, you know, right. I don't know what is. Uh, Lori and I often say, you know, like, for so long, we were made to think that we sucked in different ways. And mm. siempre we worked and worked and worked and we would remind each other, no, no, girl, you're good. Look at what you did. Look at the change that you caused. That's the power of journalism. You know, look at this exclusive that we got because of your sources. Yes. That's the power of journalism. That is your value. Remember that. Lo que te digan, take it, learn, whatever. But remember that you are worth something, that we are worth it. And so reminding each other constantly of that was so important. And even afterwards, you know, all these tweets, all these people coming out in support and saying we have we worked with them personally. We did stories with them. We watched them on the news. And I'm here to vouch for their work is like I, the validation that we didn't get and that we so desperate, like we needed. <laughs> so what comes next then? So in, in essence, um, you've taken a risk as you, Lori and Kristen, on behalf of all of us Latinos in the news business. And some people would say it was a big risk. Some people would say, you know, and I, I think that Lori kind of alluded that like people were like, oh my God, Lori, don't write this essay because you're going to be unhireable, whatever. But from what I hear, she's got job offers coming in by the dozens, uh, you know, speaking gigs, all the rest. So apparently everybody who told you that you shouldn't stand up for yourself was completely wrong. And I guess what advice would you give to Latinas in the news business who find themselves in a situation similar to yours? You're getting gringo splained by people who have no context in the immigrant community, no context about what it's like to be a Latina. What do you tell them? To, like, how, how, how would you help them? What would you do if somebody called you tonight and said, look, Sonia, the same thing's happening in my newsroom in 
in California and in, in, in DC and New York, wherever, right? Uh, what what would what advice would you give them? What would be kind of step one to make change from your experience, the, the the terrible experience you've been through? How would you help another Latina or another group of Latinas in a newsroom make the kind of change that you all are making now in Denver, now in Tegna, and now at the federal level? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say that our it's it's. I understand and I have a lot of grace for that fear, but look at what has happened. Take our case as an example. Look at what has happened afterwards to see other people that you worked with, that you interviewed, that you built relationships with, to see them stand up and defend your work like no one else has, it's, it's worth it to, to, to give yourself the, your voice, that power back that you so desperately fight to give others in your stories. We do this. I, I tell my sister all the time, I have no problem doing stories on, on, on people and helping people and, elevating other people's voices when it came to me it was very difficult pero me acordé of what's in here that drives me and gives me the strength to do it to other people for other people that i was like i need to do it for myself también you know and let our example our our aftermath be an example of we have a lot more support than we think a lot more support in the legislature with families. Now I have a new job. I, I have, I've done two stories. I just started my new job. I've done two. Congratulations. Stories. Thank you so much. And each one of those stories have already made a difference and had an impact in those communities. Two stories. I mean, wow. Two for the, two. Uh, Two for two, what the magic that happens when you allow a journalist to be their authentic selves. I love that. I love that so much. So let me ask you, last question. Um, and this is a question we ask all of our first time guests. Um, who are, I would say that you, Lori, Kristen, and when we asked Lori this question, obviously she shouted out to both of you, but who are, the most underrated workers in the American newsroom, workers that are being their authentic self, but perhaps not getting the attention or the credit that they get, that they deserve for the work that they're doing in their newsroom. I mean, in your case, wow, it sounded like you're doing the job for three, four, five people. I can't imagine a better definition of an underrated news worker than what you were at Nine News, which is again, why it's so horrific, the way that you were mistreated and discriminated against by management and, 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 and by the culture that was allowed, that the parent company allowed to persist in that job environment. So who would you shout out to then as the most underrated workers in the American newsroom? I would say that those workers are the allies like the Christians and the Lorries in my newsroom that even when you feel the most defeated, they come back to your desk and remind you what you're made of and remind you the impact your stories have already had. They remind you of your value, of your worth, and give you that fuel that you desperately need to move on the next day and say, oh, no, 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 this is not the last of me. I have so much to give and I'm going to keep fighting because I believe in what I do. And I believe these communities need to have a platform for their voice. So it is those allies in the newsroom like Lori and Kristen, for sure. I love it. Sonia, is there anything else you want to tell our audience here on Meet La Prensa and a nation of news workers who are riveted by what's going on with you three, with you, Kristen and Lori. Just thank you. Thank you so much. Te digo, like, I, 
I come from an immigrant family. I come from a family who is from extremely humble beginnings. My parents to this day, hablan muy poquito inglés, um, but they just support me like no other, you know? And, and that support that I've received from my family, from community, from former journalists, it's what keeps us strong. And even though the fight is hard and the fight seems never ending, it is each other who will make the change and who will give each other that fuel when we need it to be there for each other. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, other journalists. Thank you. De veras por todo, todo el apoyo, for all the support. No, gracias a ti que la lucha es, es de nosotros, es de todos, todos nosotros. And so I'm saying thank you so much for taking a stand because honestly, I, in my 12 years kind of in and out of the news business, I've never been more inspired by three Latinas taking a stand against injustice, uh, against, you know, against all odds. And now, I mean, winning, like just, just winning. And so I'm really looking forward to this FTC report. This, this, the, the report that comes out. I can't wait to read all the receipts and see all the names. Sonia, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on Meet La Prensa. Viewer, if you like what you see here, be sure to like and subscribe to this video. You can find Sonia's Twitter handle in the description of this video. Thank you so much for watching another episode of Meet La Prensa. That's a wrap. What do you